unmarked graves is not a phrase that many in Canada expect to hear associated with the actions of their own government. But in the past few months, that's exactly what has come to light for all to see. The truth of what happened in residential schools to Indigenous children, and which still reverberates in their families and communities, well, it's devastating and frankly makes demands of us all to confront it and to learn. And with us to help with that, we're joined on this Canada Day from Prince George, British Columbia, by Cindy Blackstock, Executive Director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. She's a professor at the School of Social Work at McGill University, and we are delighted to welcome you back to our airwave, Cindy Blackstock. How do we find you on this day? Well, it's a day of real reconciliation in many ways. We're trying to reconcile the values of Canada, the justice, the fairness, uh, the respect, the honoring, uh, with the lived reality, and sadly, the reality that far too many First Nations children died with in uh, these residential schools. And then there's another piece of reconciliation that needs to happen, Stephen, and I think in some ways it's even more difficult for Canadians, and that is to realize that the injustices are continuing on our watch. But that's the real learning opportunity, because that's something we can seriously do something with. Let me pick up on that phrase, learning opportunity, because... I suspect for many Canadians, the revelations of the last couple of months of these children's grave sites, that will be news to them. I also suspect that it's not at all news to people in Indigenous communities across this country. And I just want to ask you, how widely known was this among Indigenous communities? Because clearly it wasn't among the rest of us. Right. It was widely known. Very Everyone knew it, about it. Um, and it was also another area where it was widely known is within the government of Canada itself. I mean, Stephen, in 1907, Canada's chief medical health officer of the Indian Department, Dr. Bryce, went out and surveyed the health of the kids in the residential schools and found that the government of Canada was funding these kids for health care, way lesser levels than everybody else. And the health practices were terrible. And that was contributing to death rates of 25% in one year rising to 50% in over three years. And in one school, for every three children that walked in, only one walked out alive. The doctor said, equalize the health funding and improve these healthcare practices and these kids could live. And Canada chose not to do it. They chose to retaliate against their own public health officer. And this was carried in the media. There was headlines like, Children dying like flies, absolute inattention to the bare necessities of health. So the editors and the media were paying attention. And some of the public were too. There was a lawyer named Samuel Hume Blake that said that in that Canada fails to obviate the preventable causes of death, it brings itself into unpleasant nearness with manslaughter. Hmm. And we see this in a whole history of residential schools where persons of all walks of life, hunters who would find the kids um, in the woods beaten, um, people within this, in the department itself, people who even operated uh, the churches or neighbors would report abuse and the deaths of these kids and Canada would choose not to do it. So Canada knew about it all the time. The communities knew about it. But when the community spoke, it was so confrontational to people's ideas of what this country was like. They would often just dismiss them and turn away and that's what we need to make sure it doesn't happen this time. People can't look away. The language you are using is the language one associates with a crime scene. And if, yes. in fact, these residential schools were crime scenes, what are the forward-facing implications of that? Well, it's uh, not just uh, my language. Uh, Dr. Bryce, in 1922, after he was pub pushed out of the public service, he published a pamphlet, Stephen, that's called A National Crime. Um, and it detailed all of his efforts to try and get the Canadian government to pay attention. I think what it really means is that the federal government and the churches ought to be looked at for their institutional and possibly criminal roles in the residential schools. There are individuals who also should be held accountable, but the institutions themselves ought to be also get the critical lens of whether or not there was criminal wrongdoing by these institutions, particularly because as early as 1908, we have a lawyer saying Canada, for one, brought itself into unpleasant nearness with manslaughter. The question remains, was it manslaughter? Well, uh, presumably, 
I mean, the institutions are still around to be held accountable. Presumably, the people who actually did these things are all dead. So how do you hold them to account? Well, not all of them, sadly, Stephen, because you've got to remember the last residential school closed in 1996. So there are people around today who would have stopped those institutions. And um, they ought, to the degree possible, they ought to be held responsible. But what we also need to do is we need to find out, even for those perpetrators that have passed on, what did they do? And more importantly, what happened to the kids that they victimized? So that we can set a true telling of history so that we can learn from it and, and come closer to realizing the values of the country and get rid of these chasms because colonialism did two things. One is, of course, all these horrendous injustices and deaths of these children and that continue in some form today. And then on the other side was this complete erasure of history by the Canadian government to keep Canadians in the dark. Because the view was, if Canadians actually understood what was happening to these kids, they would be like Blake and they would be like Bryce and they'd be outraged and they'd be speaking and demanding change. And the government did not want that to happen. So the non-Indigenous population was also victimized by this colonialism because it was robbed of its opportunity to do better. I, I should ask you a bit of a strange question here, which is, are you a lawyer? No, <laughs> I, I'm a social worker, but... Um, I, as you know, Stephen, I've for 14 and a half years been litigating against Canada. Well, that's why I asked. Equitable services today. That's so why I, I asked. I got a law degree to learn how to do that better. Ah. Um, so, yeah, I have a law degree, but I'm not a lawyer. Okay, because, uh, I mean, I, I knew you were a PhD in social work, but of course, I and so many others always associate you with the work that you're doing in the courts. So let's yeah. go there. What are you working on now? Well, um, what a lot of folks don't know is, remember those healthcare uh, inequities that Dr. Bryce pointed to, linking to the deaths? Well, they, they were never fixed. The federal government funds First Nations public services and does so at far lesser levels than everyone else. That's why we got things like no water on some First Nations reserves. Um, and in 2000, when I was fresh on the national scene, I bounced on there and I thought, you know, we're going to document these inequalities with the federal government. We're going to cost out solutions and we're going to show them how they're creating harms to these children, even to harms where they were driving them into foster care because families didn't have the help they needed to recover from the trauma of residential schools at greater numbers than the residential schools. So we did all that. And the government welcomed the report, said they review it, and then they did nothing. I got sucked in a second time and we did another report, same result. So in 20, 2007, we filed a human rights complaint along with the Assembly of First Nations against Canada, alleging that what they were doing was racially discriminatory. Canada fought that case tooth and nail all the way. And then finally in 2016, we got the decision that substantiated the discrimination and ordered Canada to stop. The, the tribunal found that not only was Canada's discrimination pushing kids unnecessarily into foster care, it was resulting in serious harms and even the deaths of some children. Canada agreed with the decision, and then they did exactly what they did with those reports. They ignored it. So now, fast forward past the TRC, where equity and child welfare and something called Jordan's Principle, which is to ensure equitable public services are given to First Nations kids, those are the top calls to action. Fast forward to now, we've had 19 non-compliance and procedural orders against the feds. And just last a uh, couple of weeks ago, we were in federal court uh, where they were trying to overturn some of the tribunal's orders to get them closer to uh, justice. So the feds continue to fight tooth and nail against this generation of kids. I'd be very interested in, in your theory as to why you think that's happening, given that the current prime minister says Reconciliation with Indigenous communities is his top agenda. Yeah, I don't get it. And I also didn't get it like uh, the week before we were in the federal court hearings, the Prime Minister was on the floor of Parliament saying he was not fighting Indigenous children in court. And I was thinking, well, then why are we going to court next week? And the public can just tune in and watch this. It's almost like they're in an alternate kind of QAnon reality sometimes. What gives me some hope is that the Canadian public seems to be far out in front of the federal government on this one. Like the federal government is really still operating from a deeply colonial place. 
In fact, Stephen, we don't have to look far to look at that. We can look at the contemporary inequalities and the non-compliance with the law, but we can also look at that racist Indian Act that was used to push kids into residential schools. It's still on the books, despite there being a plan to get rid of it uh, released in 1996. So I, 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 I think it's that colonialism that just pervades their minds. They just can't reconcile the fact that they themselves are doing the injustice. They'd rather look at it in the past so that they don't have to really do anything other than apologize and send hopes and prayers. You did mention the TRC a moment ago, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I want to follow up on that because um, not long ago on this program, I think it was about six months ago, we did convene a group of Indigenous leaders, and I want to play you just a little snippet from that program. This is, a, I think, the youngest member of that group, Gabriel Fayon, from A7G, you know, Gabrielle. Um, yeah. It's a grassroots organization based in Ottawa, and let's just take a look at that, and then we'll come back and chat. I do believe that reconciliation is ultimately the responsibility of Canadians. It is not up to Indigenous people to repair the harms that Canadians have done to Indigenous peoples. And right now, what we're seeing is that the burden is falling on the shoulders of Indigenous people, and that's just not fair. Um, a lot of young people that I work with actually believe that reconciliation is dead. A lot of young people think reconciliation is dead. What would you say to Gabrielle? I think she's right. Hmm. Um, she's right. Uh, you know, I hear so often from government leaders and others uh, that, you know, yes, it, it was bad, it happened, it was a dark chapter in our history, uh, that's a speech given by the wrongdoers. Uh, the wrongdoers give that speech when they don't want to do the work to set things right, and particularly when they're accountable for the perpetration of ongoing injustices. Um, I think that there hasn't been the type of heavy lifting that the Prime Minister Harper uh, promised in the apology to residential schools in 2008, where he said the burden of this whole thing will be lifted from the shoulders of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples and placed on the shoulders of the government and Canadians. That, that didn't really happen. It's still sitting, the weight is still on our shoulders. And while we want, absolutely need to take accountability and provide leadership and tell people how problems can be fixed, uh, it's up to Canadians to pile on to those solutions and not let governments get away with saying, oh, we're going to review this, or like they did with the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. We're going to, after two years, we're going to create a plan for a plan to implement the solutions. We have to, we have to hold them accountable for that stuff. Does it feel to you as if this time it's different? When you've seen the reaction of non-Indigenous Canadians to the discovery of these mass graves, discovery for them, not for you, but for them, does it feel different this time? Yeah, you know, I think the stories have piled up on the Canadian consciousness in a way that makes it difficult to look away. And one of the real, um, the epicenters of colonialism is a savage and civilized dichotomy where everything that First Nations, Métis and Inuit do is savage and everything that other people do is civilized. And through that, we become dehumanized. I think... People, when they think about three-year-olds buried in unmarked graves, dying alone, away from their families, that just gets at their humanity in a way that cuts through that colonial dichotomy in a way that was not possible before. But I think we need to credit those residential school survivors for the courage of coming forward and telling their truths. And I, I use the word truths versus stories because I think we called them stories it's almost so that we wouldn't have to listen to them because they were so comforting to us, but they are truths. Hmm. I want to circle back to somebody that you referenced at the beginning of our conversation, and that's Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce, mm -hmm. who is a person of immense significance in the history of this country, and yet who I suspect uh, doesn't have a statue to him uh, anywhere, but you know who he is. I'll get you to speak to this, Cindy Blackstock, if you would. That's you. Where are you? And who is that? Who's there? Yeah, that's uh, that we're in Beechwood Cemetery in the lands of unceded Algonquin territory. And I'm facing the grave of Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce. Um, I first came to see him, Stephen, the day before Prime Minister Harper apologized. I found that he was buried just a few miles away from where I live. So I went and I got a bouquet of brightly colored flowers um, and I went to thank him. 
for what he did because he had the moral courage of standing up for these kids when it really mattered. And um, I, I thanked him and I told him that maybe not coincidentally, that exactly 100 years after his 1907 report, we filed that human rights case. And I told him about the case and I told him I'd be back when they when the kids won. And uh, I would go back from time to time to just be inspired by him to try and just feel what what else could I do to be do a better job for these kids? Because sometimes I felt like I was screaming into silence. Um, and while I was there, I thought he needed a bigger garden around his grave. So I got my shovel out and some friends and we put a <laughs> garden. And now, um, you know, he, children are learning about him. His family has unveiled a historical plaque at Beechwood telling the story. And he's become one of the most visited graves at Beechwood. So people are going there just as I did to become inspired by this early example of reconciliation and action. So note to people watching or listening to this, if you're in the nation's capital over the summertime, this would be a good place to go. Now, I yeah. gather his gravesite is not that far away from Duncan Scott's. Who is he? Yes. Who was he? Yeah, he, uh, most of your viewers would have learned about him uh, like I did in uh, English literature class. He was a Confederate poet, but his day job for 52 years was really heading up the residential school file. Um, he was hired by John A. Macdonald himself, um, and he rose quickly through the ranks. He was the man who said no to Dr. Bryce, who refused those reforms. And he's buried just over the hill uh, from Dr. Bryce. Now, Duncan Campbell Scott had a plaque, uh, This is, and I went to see his gravesite just before the TRC report, and it was glowing, you know, recipient of honorary degrees, Confederate poet. I thought to myself, this one needs a revision. So uh, we worked with Beechwood, we worked with uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, uh, Murray Wilson and uh, historian John Malloy, and now his plaque reads, uh, Confederate poet and cultural genocide. And what about Dr. Bryce's, has he got a plaque? He's got a plaque, yeah. And uh, it talks about him, not only in his role of residential schools, but also, Stephen, this is really important for people to know. He wrote Ontario's first health code. This guy was at the top of his profession. He was the president of the American Public Health Association, founder of the Canadian Public Health Association. Uh, he really led and set the foundation for public health, which we were all benefiting by in COVID-19. And yet he was completely erased from Canadian history because the Canadian government didn't want anybody to know about him. Do you have any theories as to why Dr. Bryce would have been so with it and forward thinking at a time when everybody else was so backward thinking? Well, you know, here's the interesting thing, Stephen, is I'm finding not everybody else was backward thinking. When, uh, when his report was leaked to the media, Editors of newspapers all over the country put it on the front page, and you'll know this, you're, you're from the generation of newspapers like I am, above the fold where you put the big news. Um, people, up there, I think sometimes what we think is, oh, well, they didn't know any better back then. That's why they did those things. But the truth is when you put people in conversation with one another, you find that people knew it was immoral and it quite possibly is illegal. The problem was, just as it is now, is that people know it, but not enough of us speak out, speak out long enough, and hold those accountable for change, and don't look away until the change happens on the ground. Look past the announcements. Politicians say all kinds of stuff. I don't really listen to what they say. I watch what they do. You know, while we're on the subject of honoring those who came before us in history, I would love your take on something that is just absolutely white hot right now in this country, and that is the issue of, of course, for example, taking down statues of Sir Johnny MacDonald, mm -hmm. taking down statues of Edgerton Ryerson, changing the name potentially of that university as well. What's your view on all of that? Well, you know what? Um, I think uh, colonialism was the biggest cancel culture. It erased people like Dr. Bryce and it erased all those children that were discovering in the ground. I believe in a whole and balanced telling of history. And so um, in the case of Beechwood, what we've done is we've really... Uh, try to really reconcile these people as individuals in their time. But we put them in conversation with one another to hold them accountable to the standards of that period. Um, when we have statues, it's kind of like a, a, a celebration of that person. Like I walk by the, the statue of Laurier on Parliament Hill en route to the memorial for the 215 kids. 
Laurier was prime minister when Dr. Bryce released that 1907 report, and yet he did nothing about it. But he's completely, or he gets a complete pass in history. I think if you're going to leave his statue where it is, you need to tell the full story of what he did. And we also need to recognize uh, not all legacies are equal. So, for example, in Duncan Campbell Scott, yes, he has a poetic legacy, but that's eclipsed by the residential school legacy he left. So, too, with other political leaders. It's not that they did all these good things and this one bad thing. It's the weight of the legacies they left us. In which case, in our remaining moments here, I do want to ask you on this Canada Day about... Well, what we have to celebrate or maybe what we don't have to celebrate. And to that end, uh, I want to read a quote here from Chief Philip Franks of the Watam Mohawk community in the Muskoka region, mm -hmm. um, who had the following to say, I would only hope that the people who have cottages, parts of which were a part of Wata lands but taken away a hundred years ago by the same government mentality, will reflect on the whole issue. As a sign of respect, it would certainly help relationships if there were no fireworks celebrations. I do understand some may regard this as a cancelled culture, as recently coined, but really, whose culture was cancelled? I appreciate your thoughts and efforts to help in educating the populace. We have been trying to do so for a long time. Now, I gather cottagers, for example, on Gibson Lake near the Wata Mohawk community in Muskoka have lowered their flags to half-mast, and then they have, generally speaking, decided to uh, adhere to the advice of Chief Franks and not to have fireworks. Um, admittedly, as people watch this or listen to this, uh, Canada Day is almost over, but what kind of thing would you recommend as well? You know, I think too often in Canada we have lazy patriotism. I live right in Ottawa, right in the middle of uh, Canada Day every year, whether I like it or not, and I see people painting flags on their faces, holding flags, wearing red and white, and they're obviously really proud, but when I see them do that, I think, what are you actually standing up for? Um, and they, they, when you, you ask them, it's kind of like the values, it's a great country. And I think, okay, well, on this Canada Day, you got to really reflect on questions of justice. you got to really reflect on questions of honesty. You have to really reflect on questions of democracy. Because now more than ever, democracy is needed to end these injustices. I'd like to see people really hold themselves account to enacting those values. We can't just send people off to war to defend those values and then give them away in times of peacetime and ignore the injustices in our midst. Real patriotism is when we embrace what hurts and make sure that we honor those residential school survivors by implementing those TRC's calls to action. That's what I'm going to be doing this Canada Day. I wonder if I can follow up with uh, what is admittedly a bit of a chippy question. And in doing so, I'm... I'm hearkening back to an interview that I did with Michael Ignatiev on this program several months ago in which he said, we need to be able to have two competing thoughts in our heads at the same time. Namely, number one, yes, the legacy that this country has to overcome is immense and we need to do that work, PDQ. But he also said, look around the world and we can also say at the same time that Canada is, relative to other countries, one of the most successful and just countries anywhere in the world. Are those competing yet simultaneously held views possible for you? Um, you know, the, there's a thing in psychology that whatever you say after the but is actually what you really mean. <laughs> and that's been the problem in those competing ideas is that people have said, well, Canada is such a great country and that means I can set this aside, these children aside, the past injustices and the current injustices. I would say in order to give that second part of the the truth meaning, the fact that Canada is a just country, you must deal with this other reality. That's the, that should be the difference between Canada and the rest of the world, is that we don't look away and ignore it. Not only the historical realities, but also, much harder, the current ones. And I would hope that every can Canadian would have a copy of the TRC's calls to action. And uh, when politicians of all stripes come to their doors during the next federal election, Ask every candidate how they're going to implement all 94 and tell them to stop fighting kids in court and stop fighting residential school survivors. Steve, they're fighting St. Anne's residential school survivors where there was an electric chair. They're using our tax dollars to fight against these people. That has to stop. Yeah, I, I don't get that, frankly. Does, does, does that make any sense to you at all? I mean, any sense no. at any level? You know, it feels mean to me. 
You know, I, well, the government was holding all these news conferences, in my view, time to try and distract from what they were doing in federal court against the kids like this. Oh, well, we can put First Nations names on, on passports. Um, I was at a news conference with residential school survivors from St. Anne's. And all they want is peace. They want someone to recognize their truths. Yeah, they didn't die in residential school, but what they experienced was like a torture camp. And instead of having the government of Canada make all these flowery pronouncements about reconciliation and wearing orange shirts and wearing more regalia than even I wear, uh, what they want is for them to stop fighting them in court and we'll give them justice. That's the least we can give them as a country. And if you're watching this program, you know, we're on TVO. St. Anne's was in Ontario. This is not that far away from our collective yeah. experience. Well, in our last few seconds here, let me just, um, let me ask you this final question. Can, can you, do you think you can see a day in the not too distant future when you will feel like celebrating Canada Day because you think this country has taken the steps it needs to take? I hope so. It depends on how long people are gonna watch. Um, what we know from Dr. Bryce is, and what I've seen even in uh, our work with the current generation of kids, is while the headlines are there, the politicians pay attention. But when the headlines die and the public attention goes to other things, that's when the injustices continue. So as long as we keep this focus, all of us as people, every single person holds the government to account for ending these injustices, hold the churches account for what they did, then yes, we can do it. And I see it in the kids where they're learning about this stuff in school and they don't normalize it. They think, what the heck? We have an Indian Act and we're fighting residential school survivors in court and we make excuses when we get, don't get clean water and we tell people they have to wait five years. That doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense. They're right. So we can change it. Cindy Blackstock, we can't thank you enough for spending so much time with us here on TVO on this Canada Day, you've given us an immense amount to think about, and I'm sure we will. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephen. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.